<laughs> I had a friend of mine once had a course at Harvard. I think it was in like Eucharitic or something. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, he was the only student. And uh and the professor, I guess as much as I do, just kept lecturing as usual. <laughs> But he and but even if like he dozed off and he would kind of like wake up and realize that it had gone on. <laughs> and he was wondering if he asked whether he could uh, use the bathroom, whether he would find the professor was still lecturing while he was gone. I don't know. Anyway, but I am being recorded, so in theory. Oh, why did it suddenly get all fuzzy? So in theory, I guess I'm also lecturing to the people who will watch this film. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah. Um, so I think so far, what we've read so far, it may seem like uh, well, I don't know. You could tell me <laughs> it seemed this way to you, but that Fuller, although interesting, is not really on the road from Emerson to Nietzsche. So, like in a strictly historical sense, that's definitely true. Ray, like Nietzsche, read Emerson but didn't read Fuller, and as far as I know, didn't know that Fuller existed. Um, but you know, so that, and not that that by itself is irrelevant. That is kind of a problem. I think, as I said at the beginning of the course, that's you know, depending on how you look at the history of philosophy, I guess if you look at it as kind of a bag of things that people said once, you know, that we could pick one out and look at, then it's pretty easy to put in neglected people. Put them back in because you just like put them back in the bag. <laughs> but if you think of the history of philosophy as, or the history of Western philosophy, I guess we would say in this case. Oh, good. Thank you. It's not my like treat two people. All right. <laughs> A little bit natural. So uh, that, you know, if you think of the history of Western philosophy as a tradition where people are reacting to each other and you, you know, you get to understand what's important in the past by seeing how people react to it later on and so on and so forth, then uh, it's not so easy to just reinsert people who were neglected because they were neglected. <laughs> so, uh, so that is an issue. I mean, I certainly wish Nietzsche had read Fuller. I think he probably would have had a lot to say about it if he had. <laughs> but um, in any case, uh, nevertheless, you might think that, you know, leaving that aside, that there's a further problem, namely that, you know, even from our point of view, this isn't like a step that could help us make a transition from Emerson to Nietzsche. And it might seem like um, that, it's, on the contrary, it's kind of a step backwards towards a more like conventional or traditional point of view. I mean, after all, she wants us to be good citizens, preferably of a good nation. She wants us to be nice to everyone, it seems like. She wants us to free the slaves. She wants us to treat criminals and the insane humanely. Um, I mean, all that is good, actually, but <laughs> as, as we agree, but as perhaps Emerson and Nietzsche don't necessarily agree. And, uh, you know, like we can't imagine, at least I can't imagine her saying the way Emerson does, but. Are they my poor? <laughs> you know. So, um, 
So I started, I think, kind of counteracting that impression, actually, in what I was talking about last time. I mean, it's true that in a way, you know, the position she's in looks a little bit more conventional or something like that. But if you look closely into the reason she's in that position, you see that it's pretty radical. So, um, like, the reason that criminals and the insane are to be humanely treated, and the way they're supposed to be humanely treated, um, or also if you look into the reason why we can or even must place our hopes in the nation, um, it turns out that it's because we have to learn to identify ourselves with insanity and crime. Hey, um, um, in other words, uh, like if these people, and you know, so like, her case for being humane to criminals is not, well, maybe they're not really criminals. I mean, I'm sure if you asked her that, she would agree that, yeah, maybe some people are, or maybe a lot of people are falsely, you know, accused and whatever, but that's not what she's focusing on. And similarly, you know, with the insane, the issue is that, like, um, well, maybe they just have a valid other way of thinking or something like that. Again, she would probably agree with that in some cases, but that's not what she's focusing on. She's focusing, she's saying, you know, given that this is a sickness, if we agree that this is a sickness, how do you relate to it? Um, and the answer is that if those people don't seem like you're poor, so to speak, it's, it's because you haven't seen well enough who you are. Um, so, you know, like the, the way I have to treat them humanely is I have to treat them like people that I have something to learn from. Um, uh, and the reason I have to is because I have to make them into my poor, so to speak. And I have to make them into my poor because that's the only way I'm ever going to recognize my own poverty. So, um, so I think if you look at it that way, it's actually sounds at least compared to now. I mean, of course, it's unfair to Emerson above all people to pick that one passage and tag Emerson to it, you know. But still, like if you compare the two on that one point, in a sense. Uh, Fuller is actually going beyond Emerson, or more radical than Emerson. She's saying that I can't achieve self-reliance without um, um, understanding how untrustworthy I am in my current state. <laughs> um, but so in any case, I think in these three dialogues that I signed for today with Lori and Aglaron, I guess that's how you pronounce, I'm not even sure how to put it. So there's, there's this, uh, or well, I guess we usually use the Latin form, Aglarus. It's like a mythical Athenian princess. <laughs> um, uh, so, like, apparently, Aglaron is, I mean, I don't know why he has this ending. But, uh, yeah, and Lori, you know, which in this case, I assume is short for Lawrence is, uh, I guess it's, used, it's pronounced the same way we pronounce Lori when it's short for Lauren or Laura. Um, 
Um, right. So Laurie and Laurel. Um, so uh, these three dialogues seem to take things a step further. Um, Maria, I guess I was going to say this right away, which I already kind of got to, which is like, I don't know what to say about the significance of these names. I, I always wonder about the significance of names of characters and dialogues, but I, I rarely turn up anything useful. I, I mean, unless it's obvious, right? Like in Leibniz's new essays, where it calls one of them. Uh, Well, if they and the other Theophilus, right, like loving truth and like beloved of God, or, you know, I mean, but yeah, in this case, I'm not sure. I mean, but this is certainly a really, well, I'm pretty sure, actually, I mean, they did use these weird names in the 19th century, but uh, still, I'm pretty sure this is a really unusual name. She must have chosen to, to name him after this princess for some reason, uh, but I can't say what. Uh, I mean, the father was Krekrops, who was this mythical king of Athens who had the tail of a serpent. <laughs> <laughs> There's various stories about her. Uh, but I think what I can say about both of these names is they're both kind of gender ambiguous. I, and I mean, I think that would be true for her readers, although I'm, again, I'm not sure. Like, I'm not sure how those names sounded then. Um, and then the third character, so the, the first dialogue, a drive through, through Boston has a third character, character, namely the narrator, who, you know, refers to themselves as myself. And, um, um, When I first read this, I assumed that we were supposed to take the narrator to be fuller. But, um, you know, when I read it again this year, I realized there isn't really much justification for that. Um, and I even wonder if her readers would assume that the third member of the party must also be male. I don't know. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't know enough to say what, like, how would it be normal for two men and an apparently unrelated woman to go riding horses off into the countryside together? I'm not sure. <laughs> but anyway, it certainly doesn't. There's, there's, there actually are no indications of the gender of the narrator either. Um, and, uh, and moreover, the end of the dialogue, But I do not understand Aglaron yet, nor what he expects from this Emily. Yet her character, though almost featureless at first, gains distinctness as I think of it more. Perhaps in this life I shall find its key. I mean, that to me kind of seems to imply a distinction between the narrator and Flora. I mean, it's hard to say because I also don't know if um, if any of these characters, whether Aglaron or Laurie or Emily or the other various characters like L and V, whether any of them are actually based on real people. 
Um, but um, I mean, at the very least, if these characters, if Fuller invented these characters, then that would be a weird thing to say. And perhaps in this life, I should. Right? I mean, like, there's, you know, I mean, we're not not totally absurd. Maybe you could say that, right? Like, especially if you think of artistic genius the way Schelling does. You know, you could think that even in your own creation, you haven't learned. To understand yet, um, but uh, but anyway, there there's at least some hint there that we might think of the narrator as just a third character. Um, and the, the narrator participates only a, like very few times in the dialogue. Once is in this discussion of what color houses in America should be, and then, and then they don't say anything until the end when they say that. Uh, I cannot understand you, Aguaron. I do not guess the scope of your story, whatever that means, nor sympathize with your feeling about this lady. She is a strange and I think very unattractive person. I mean, if the narrator is fuller, then that that would raise all kinds of other weird issues, right? Like Aguaron has just the character has just described Emily with all, a lot of sympathy. And then Fuller suddenly interjects. I think she's an attractive character. <laughs> that would also be weird, uh, you know. But so I, I guess I, all I can say is that that's ambiguous. There's a lot of ambiguity about this, which is probably deliberate. The, the one other thing that I've noticed before here is that. Um, on the second page, which is page 184, um, the narrator says, I have never any doubt when I write down or tell what Laurie says, but a Glaron must write for himself. And then nevertheless goes on to write for a Glaron. So, I mean, you could resolve that paradox if you thought that that actually you should identify a Glaron with Fuller. <laughs> so he is writing for herself. <laughs> but uh, that is, she is writing for herself. But uh, I mean, there's issues with that too. So I don't know. So in any case, this is all just a discussion of who these characters are, what their names mean, and uh, it's pretty inconclusive <laughs> so far. All right, but anyway, so what I wanted to get back to is the way that uh, these dialogues go a further step in like this radical direction that I was pointing out. The Fuller seems to go um, in the reading from last week. And the theme, so I think there's one important theme of the first two dialogues, at least. The third one seems to be about, I mean, it's related to things that happen in the other two, but it seems to be about something a little bit different. Um, but the, the theme of the first two seems to be announced almost immediately as soon as Aglaron starts talking. So he says, how entirely are we newborn today? How are all the past cold skies and hostile breezes vanished, et cetera, et cetera? And uh, Laurie responds by generalizing this point. It is indeed the dearest fact of our consciousness that in every moment of joy, pain is annihilated. There is no past and the future is only the sunlight streaming into the far valley. So, um, So, so far, the theme is the happiness of forgetting. Now, I mean, the happiness attached to forgetting is, we'll see that turn up next week at the beginning of Nietzsche's Uses and Disadvantages of History for Life. Um, but, um, but it doesn't stop with that. 
because Aglaron kind of objects to this generalization. And he doesn't really disagree with this. Um, but he thinks there's something else important that has to be added, which is that um, this happiness, this kind of bright sunlit happiness um, is attached to forgetting not to never having known in the first place, right? So, um, so although like it's a dear fact of our consciousness that in every moment of joy, pain is annihilated. It's the annihilation of the pain. Aglaron is claiming that, that makes the joy possible, right? And therefore Aglaron's response is, Yet it was the night that taught us to prize the day. Right? So in the moment of sunlight, we forget the night, and that brings us joy. But the night was nece a necessary part of that. Um, um, and then there's this kind of mysterious addendum where they all of a sudden are talking about if you, if you suspect that before they were only talking about the weather, <laughs> nice day today. Yeah, we forget the night, you know, whatever. But it makes it clear that they're talking about a lot more than that. So Lori says, even so, and I, you know, object to none of the quote dark masters. <laughs> so the dark masters. I. This may actually be an allusion to something. I mean, I don't know if that's a quote from something, Dark Masters. Anyway, but, uh, but so Aglaron says, nor I, because I am sure that whatever is, is good. And to find out the why is all our employment here. And the next thing is, but when feel so at home in such a day as this, when they start talking about flowers, well, uh, should have maybe thought more about that at home and what that's doing now. But anyway, what's clearly going on here is this: whatever is is good. So. Right? That's our old friend Leib Leibnizian optimism. Whatever is, is good. And Leibniz would agree with what Aglaron adds to that when he says, like, um, to find out why is all our employment here. Right? Because remember that according to Leibniz, whenever we act wrongly, it's because we fail to understand why what we're doing is right. We're doing the best thing because whatever it is is good, but we haven't understood why it's good. So our, our, all our employment here, that is the purpose of reason, so to speak, is to understand why what we're doing is good. Um, so, I mean, so, so, so far we're, we're just with Leibniz, but I think you have to add something else to get the moral that Aglaron is taking from this about the dark masters. Um, right, because um, there's nothing about the night teaching us to prize the day in Leibniz. There's confusion. And there's clarity, no less confusion than that. <laughs> so, um, I mean, there's a reason for the confusion. The reason is individuation, right? As we saw in, in Shelling, you know, like in order to create more than one thing, God had to, God, God had to, well, in order to create anything that wasn't God, God had to create some confusion, basically. 
in order, in order to, con to create more than one thing that wasn't God, God had to create different, different music, confusion, or different uh, varieties of confusion, right? So, I mean, so there is a reason for it, but the reason for it is not that it teaches us to prize clarity. Um, so, I mean, I think the other piece that Aglaron is adding in here is the same basically Kantian piece that we saw in Schelling, that mere privation is not enough to make a limit. There has to be a counterpositing or resistance. So um, that's why, um, like, the fact that our business here is to learn why means that um, 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 our business is forgetting the dark masters, <laughs> right? Like our business is not would not be complete if there were no resistance to it. Um, so, so that makes the sound less like straight lineups and more like straight shell, right? Like, you know, so what's going on here is our business is to overcome a certain kind of barrier um, that. Um, In a sense, is our own fault. I'm actually not sure. See that here. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely our own fault in the sense that uh, students are not having sufficient understanding of why whatever is is good. But um, I don't know how to connect this. What I was saying before about about Fuller's version of that, which is that you know, dissatisfaction is our fault because we haven't learned what we should want. Um, I guess that, that kind of goes together. Whatever is, is good, meaning we have to understand why we want it. We have to understand why we should be satisfied with what is. Um, so it's our fault that we're that we're just that we're um, um dissatisfied with what is, even though it doesn't deserve it. Now, I mean, if you think that's far-fetched that she's thinking something like that, this is exactly what they quote the Son of God as saying his sin is in Festus. Um, yeah, this is on page 255 in the Festus dialogue. Um, if I have sinned, it is, in, it is but in wishing what can never be, that all souls may be saved. For it is wrong to wish what is not, as the Father makes and orders every instant what is best. Now, I mean, that's not Fuller speaking, that's Fuller quoting his poem, Festus which I'll talk about briefly and what it is when I get to it. But, but, the, but, but that exact thought is there, right? The, 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 the sin is to wish what is not. <laughs> um, right, so uh, um, so there's, uh, there's like a version of that idea from Schelling here that we're overcoming a self-imposed barrier but the barrier was self-imposed 
You didn't understand what to be satisfied with. And what we have to do now is, is forget that. We have to forget that self-imposed dissatisfaction. So um, and there's a kind of weird reverse Platonism here. Um, which I'm not sure what to, what else to say about, but it's worth keeping you or like flagging that that's happening, right? Like if you compare this to the beginning of experience where I guess there's different ways of taking this. I mean, it's the beginning of experience. It's also a time when Emerson is expressing dissatisfaction. His dissatisfaction is with the genius who mixed too much leafy in our cup. So we don't remember how we got here. Um, and but whereas uh, Aglaron here is, is and, and Laurie both are talking about how, like their satisfaction at the fact that they've been given enough leave to forget <laughs> the, the difficult lesson that got them there. Um, so, right, so so it's unlike the platonic doctrine that the soul has forgotten the good and now has to be reminded of it. What the soul is forgetting now is the evil. Okay, but like I said, I don't know exactly what to do with that. Um, but uh, um, but I do want to say that. Um, so so far, this is a kind of version of shelling. Um, um, but uh, in the Festus dialogue, it seems that, and in this case, Laurie and Aguaran are both agreed on this, it seems to, to break out in an even stronger way. So by the way, so what this poem Festus is, I have not read it, although I'm tempted to try to read it. <laughs> It was written by um, Philip James Bailey, um, but Aglaron and Laurie probably, and Fuller herself probably don't know that because it was published first anonymously in 1839, and then it was published under his name in a new edition in 1845. So I think that's why they just keep talking about the poet, you know, have a name associated with it. But anyway, it was this guy, Philip James Bailey, this is pretty much, it's, it's a huge, long philosophical slash theological poem. Um, it's uh, pretty much the only thing that he's known for is this one poem. And he's known as the founder of the so-called spasmodic school of poetry. <laughs> that's, um, that's from the Wikipedia page, which you can follow up to see what the spasmodic school of poetry is. I didn't get very far to figure that out, but it's, this was obviously not a self-applied description. <laughs> this is how some other people describe them. Um, it's, um, I mean, I think that description kind of uh, implies sympathy with the point of view that Aguaron is taking on, the, on this poem, at least to begin with. Which is that it's like not finished. It's uh, kind of you know um, just crude and thrown together, you know. And whereas Lori is trying to defend it. So anyway, so that's what this poem is, um, and it's a it's a dramatic poem, right? It has these speakers, you know, just like Faust, which is, I mean. Clearly, Festus is somehow a, like a version of Faust. Um, um, Faust is also a little spasmodic, but <laughs> in any case. Um, so, all right. So that so they're talking about this poem, and um, 
And Lori has just gotten finished talking about how great the character of the Son of God is in the poem. So, I mean, the character in the poem is, you know, it's called Son of God, as opposed to Jesus or whatever. But uh, so anyway, Lori has just finished talking about how great that character is. And then he says, this is on page 257. I have these quotes written down in my notes, but I always think it's better if I can read it from the text. Because one thing, sometimes I notice something new about the context. So, um, right, the other powerful conception is that of the demon, the rebel in the heart, the Lucifer. This is in perfect harmony with his great thought, which, as I said before, he has not been successful in bringing out. So he here is Philip James Bailey, right, the author. So his great thought, which, as I said before, he has not been successful in bringing out of evil the way to good. Right? So evil the way to good. Means that the dark master is um, not just confusion or dissatisfaction, but is evil. Um, so, I mean, number one, if we were thinking that Fuller is not in any sense a step between Emerson and Nietzsche, I think this shows that she is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to, to think this, evil is the way to go, um, is, uh, this is a, I mean, not that, well, obviously not that Nietzsche invented it. <laughs> Here we see it before Nietzsche, right? But, um, um, but this is a characteristically Nietzschean thought. Um, I mean, or that um, I mean, it will get turned in different directions and made even worse and stranger by each other. But uh, but this is definitely a step towards the way Nietzsche is thinking about it. I think so. Um, and but in fact, then if you look farther back in the dialogue, you'll see that, and this is the thing I already read part of before, but I'll, I'll read the whole quote. Um, that it doesn't actually start with um, Festus, or sorry, with the um, with the character of Lucifer. It's the character of the Son of God is. Um, already expressing something like this, right? So back on page 255, um, Festus, who I guess at this point is in hell, says, look, who comes hither? And Lucifer says, it is the Son of God. What dost thou hear, not having sinned? And the Son of God says, for men I bore with death, for fiends I bear with sin, and death and sin are each the pain I pay. For the love which brought me down from heaven to save both men and devils. And if I have sinned, so, right, so the Son of God is saying, like, I had to die to save men from death. And now I have to sin to save fiends from sin. <laughs> Um, so, um, uh, but, okay, you know, so what, what is the sin? So, of course, the sin isn't like the Son of God, like, goes out and steals something from the store or something, and now I say, I mean, right? I mean, it's, it's a complicated sin, right? The sin is, but wishing what can never be, that all souls may be saved. <laughs> That's the sin. So, um, that is, again, the sin is 
this dissatisfaction with what is, because what is is good. Um, and the Son of God, I guess, here, now, I mean, again, this is not Fuller's Son of God, this is Philip James Bailey's Son of God, but Laurie and Agarab seem to agree that at this point, like, this is his great thought, right? And the only question is whether he got it out sufficiently. Well, this is his great thought that evil is the way to good. And um, so um, um, dissatisfaction viewed as an evil, as a sin, um, is um, the barrier that, you, that God himself must overcome, right? I mean, you, why is, you know, you might say it's not God, it's the son of God, but they, what they say, at, what, I guess this is Laurie's, yeah, Laurie's speaking at this point, the bottom of page 256, surely the mystery of the Trinity never yet was uttered in so sweet and pathetic a tone. Right, so this is, I mean, so, but, so it's not Unitarian, <laughs> right? <laughs> It's the mystery of the Trinity, the back to the Trinity again, but the Trinity is expressing now the fact that um, even God has to sin by being dissatisfied with himself in order to um, um, achieve what? Reconciliation with his creation, let's say. With, with what with the external to himself that he's created. Um, so it's still, I mean, I can still draw the same pictures, <laughs> right? But it's just started to mean something really stranger, I think. That I mean, it's not that different from the, the, the conclusion that I suggested that Coleridge was trying to head off, that God's creation of the world is, is, is original sin. <laughs> but again, Coleridge is trying to head it off, right? Coleridge doesn't want to end up, the antinomium doesn't want to end up, you know, the, the bad kind of mystic, um, whereas uh, it appears that um, Bailey and Fuller, in agreement with him, are biting that bullet <laughs> and saying that, um, yeah, you know, the infinite nature sins against itself by being dissatisfied with its limits. Um, and it can only become reconciled with, with itself by like forgetting that sin, but but having gone through it, <laughs> not by staying here. Um, okay, so so that's the thought. Are there questions about this since the two of you here? Three more like to more questions if there are more people. But anyway, so that's that's the thought, evil, the way to good. And Aglaron responds, a thought to whose greatness, how few are equal. So, right, so, I mean, this is the start, I think, of Aglaron, you know, conceding that there's something to this poem that at first Laurie is praising and Aglaron is saying, you know, eh, it's not that great, um, that, um, he, you know, so Laurie is, is admitting that he, you know, that Bailey has not been successful in bringing out this thought. Now, I mean, we don't know, by the way, what was unsuccessful in this presentation. I mean, I've been acting as if Fuller agreed with everything in the quotes, but 
apparently, at least Lori and Laura don't agree with everything, and I don't know what they think is inadequate. But in any case, so, but Aglaren is like, well, yeah, but it's a thought to whose greatness, how few are equal, right? Like, I mean, you know, it's kind of, I think, I take that to mean kind of like, it's just great that he got it out at all. <laughs> so, um, why are so few equal to this thought? Um, well, here's the answer. While one party would ignore and annihilate by denial the soil from which we grow, others again lie too near the ground, ever trailing along its surface their languid leaves, and forget that it must be penetrated with divine rays to be transmitted into beauty and glory. And then the end of Aglaron's speech, which um, also might remind us of Nietzsche is how much we need a great thinker who should reconcile these two statements. Does the poet prophecy such an one? <laughs> right? <laughs> so Lauren is talking about the philosophers of the future or something like that. But anyway, never mind that. Go back, uh, go back to so like why is it that that it's so hard for people to get this thought and that the, Issue is that there's two possibilities, both of which are wrong. So there's a kind of plant that's growing out of the soil. Now, what kind of plant is it? Um, so, you know, it has roots in the soil and it has some glory up here. <laughs> That's so like um so once again we'll see the same metaphor in the uses and disadvantages of history for life. Um but in Nietzsche this plant is a tree. It's a tree that like is um and the question is how much it will remember or forget its root. Um, how much it's healthy for it to remember or forget its root, you know, something like that. Um, whereas, uh, I assume that since we're in Fuller, this plant is a flower. I mean, of course, it could be both. It could be a magnolia or an orange, which is both a tree and a flower. But, uh, um, but Nietzsche doesn't mention any flowers when he talks about this. So, um, um, why do I assume it's a flower? Well, I mean, if you've read all this color, I think you, you know why I assume it's a flower. She's really into flowers. <laughs> um, and like, uh, I mean, apparently flowers played some kind of important role in her life. I, I read there's a um, biography of Fuller by Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who was uh, who's better known as the editor of Emily Dickinson. But um, he also wrote a biography of Fuller, and um, and yeah, he talks about how her, her mother was really attached to flowers and somehow, you know, I didn't, I don't really understand exactly what the importance of flowers was to her personally, but it had some kind of personal significance to her. And then the narrator of the Magnolia of Lake Pontchartrain says, I have lived with flowers and with them almost alone. <laughs> like only with flowers. Um, I don't know if he might be speaking for Fuller or Fuller at some stage in her life there. But, um, but beyond, or not just like beyond, but like, um, um, I was going to say beyond, like, saying like beyond that private personal significance, it has this philosophical significance. But like that very dichotomy, I think, is part of what's in question in all of these people, actually. I mean, again, it becomes most explicit in Nietzsche, but, you know, that 
um, uh, the extent to which philosophy is about um, you know, how much is it about recognizing your own roots? How much is it about forgetting them, you know, et cetera? Well, in any case, um, whatever the relationship between these two things is, there, there, there is also, I guess, I, I put it this way, there is also significance that would be intelligible to us, even if we don't know exactly what the personal significance of flowers to her was. So, um, and uh, there were a couple passages in the reading from last time where uh, she or a character of hers talks about flowers. So in The Rich Man, she says, um, flowers, the highest expression of the bounty of nature, declare that for all men, not merely labor or luxury, but gentle, buoyant, ever energetic joy was intended and bid us hope that we shall not forever be kept back from our inheritance. Um, and then in the Magnolia of Lake Pontchartrain, the narrator says, flowers, it has been truly said. Now, it has been truly said, there's actually a lot of things like this in this reading and last week's reading, where it seems like it's supposed to be a quote from somewhere, but I at least was not able to discover a source using Google. What else is there to use? <laughs> Probably something else, but anyway, using Google, I was not able to discover a source. So like, I'm not sure if it hasn't been truly said by Full, like maybe that's been truly said, right? But so in any case, flowers, it has been truly said, are the only positive present made us by nature. The only positive present made us by nature. And then going on, we have pure intercourse with these purest creations. We love them for their own sake, for their beauty's sake. As we grow beautiful and pure, we understand them better. So, um, I mean, uh, those are indications of what flowers might stand for. I wish I could base it more on the conversation that Lori and Aguaron have about flowers in the drive um, near Boston dialogue. Uh, and I think, I'm sure there is something to say about that, especially because it does, it comes right between, as I just noticed, it comes right between, you know, first there's the thing about the dark masters, and then there's, but don't we feel home at home on a day like this? And then there's the stuff about flowers, especially about yellow flowers. And then that transitions into the discussion of American versus English and Italian architecture. Um, so, uh, and remember in the thing on American literature, Fuller said um, that she expects there to be an American architecture before there's an American literature. Because in that case, there's already something to express, something like that. So, um, so, you know, Laurie and Aguaron in discussing American architecture are discussing like what Fuller sees as the potential beginning of the American nation. Right, like it's, it's act of transcendental reflection, so to speak, like coming to self-consciousness will begin if it, by having its own architecture. And they're discussing how that would happen. Um, and that's also the point where the narrator of that dialogue steps in and, you know, has a different opinion. So, um, so therefore, because it's right in that and forms a transition between those pieces, I'm sure that what they say about flowers in this dialogue is really important, but I wasn't able to get anything relevant for this point out of it. So maybe next time I teach the course, I don't know. Um, but, uh, but those other quotes from last week's reading, I think, are pretty revealing. I mean, it sounds like a flower 
stands for, or maybe it doesn't just stand for, maybe it actually is uh, the kind of pure and innocent happiness we get without having deserved it. Right again, it's the positive presence, present made to us by nature. Or it's the fact that not merely labor or luxury, but gentle, buoyant, ever energetic joy was intended for all men. Um, so therefore it's flowers are comparable to or stand for something comparable to First of all, Emerson's talk about the neutral boy, right? The neutral boy was was kind of like this stage, like the neutral the, the neutral boy was discussed was described as being sure of a dinner and disdaining as much as a lord to do ought to conciliate one, um, right? Meaning that. Uh, The neutral boy hasn't experienced this separation or sin or limitation or whatever. And a sign of that is that you know the 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 boy expects the dinner to come to him, even though he would never do anything to make it come to him, like to earn it. Um. So, you know. Um, So the flower, well, which does it stand for? This or this? Well, the flower, I mean, um, at the moment we receive the flower. Right, maybe I am starting to understand something about why that discussion of flowers is there. The moment we receive the flower, it's that moment of joy that erases, the, annihilates the thought of what came before it. Um, Maybe I actually should have talked about these things in a different order, in a more logical order, even, or chronological order. Because I mean, I was going to say like, oh, and it's also comparable to, but like, so I should have started with Schelling. Maybe first of all, it's comparable. The flower is is comparable to the result of artistic genius, which like the you know the genius. Um, works really hard to create this work of art. But um, nevertheless, no matter how much they've done, they can't earn, they can't deserve the type of perfection that will actually come into it. Um, that's what the flower is like. Flowers, as I said, flowers are a symbol of that, or flowers actually are that. I mean, they're the positive presence that nature makes to us. So, like, I mean, if you thought of us in Shelley's terms as like creating nature, now, I mean, of course, Thor doesn't say that, although um, by bringing God into this, like indirectly through Festus, um, I mean, we could think that she's saying, she's saying that at least that's an example of this, if you create the world, because, <laughs> you know, so, like in, in Shelley's terms, where at least, like theoretically speaking, we create the world by limiting ourselves. It's like we resisted ourselves, we resisted ourselves, we resisted ourselves, but we also gave ourselves a little present. And the little present was a flower. Okay? That's not part of the resistance, that's a positive present. Um, I mean, why I think of the flowers symbolizing that? Um, 
I think it's because we don't need it. Um, I mean, the plant needs it. But I, I guess she's not thinking about that so much. At least at this moment, she's not. Yeah, I mean, you know, the orange tree and the magnolia tree never mention that the flowers are there like genitalia, right? <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't come into the conversation. We don't need to hear about the bees visiting the orange tree, and, you know. So yeah, so we're not really thinking about the fact that the plant needs the flower for something. We're thinking about the fact that the, the, the flower is like surplus. We didn't, you know, we need all the other parts of the plant, but we don't need the flower. Um, so the flower is beyond labor or even luxury. It's just an unexpected benefit, right? So, I mean, um, um, so what I was saying is in Shep, that makes it analogous to that um to that perfection of the work of artistic genius for shelling what makes it analogous to for coleridge um i don't know maybe this is right order it makes it analogous to grace right the flower is the thing that we didn't earn that we get anyway that's intended we're intended to get it anyway but we didn't earn it so it's our inheritance I guess an inheritance is also something you get, even though you didn't earn it. Right? So when she says, um, and bid us hope that we shall not forever be kept back from our inheritance, that 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 joy that we didn't earn is our inheritance. Um, So, um, so that's what flowers, if that's what flowers stand for, um, what does it mean to say, or not to, I mean, because it's just true, like, I mean, what is it? Why point out? <laughs> What's the difference of pointing out that we get them from this dark subterranean place? Right? That they're rooted in the soil. So, so I mean, so the two, again, because the two mistakes that Aglaron is worried about is that one party just um, takes in the flower and denies the, the soil that it's rooted in. That denial different from forgetting? Not sure. Anyway, well, one party would ignore and annihilate by not by denial the soil from which we grow. Others again lie too near the ground. So other people just um, um, I mean it's it's weird, it's a kind of a mixed metaphor, maybe. You think, well. Actually, I guess in, the, in this metaphor, we are the flower. While one party would ignore and annihilate by denial the soil from which we grow. So, so I guess you could say that our, our flower is that, is that unearned joy that's intended to us. Uh, I'm a little unsure if that's the right thing to say. Now. But in any case, in the metaphor, we are the flower. And the question is, so some of us deny, by, uh, annihilate by denial the soil from which we spring. Um, just think of ourselves as the flower. Whereas um, others of us uh, just um, think the soil from which we spring is enough. 
and forget that it must be penetrated with divine rays to be transmuted into beauty and glory. So um, and these are supposed to be two different ways of not being equal to the thought that evil is the way to go. So that you know, so that is one way of not being equal to it is to think good has nothing to do with evil. Good is good, right? Good is the way to go. Um, whereas the other way of not being equal to it is to think, well, since whatever is is good, evil is good, and we'll just stick with that. <laughs> Right, so um, and that's you know that's these people who trail too too near the ground, and I guess like never, therefore they never reach the flowering stage or something like that. Well, how much we need a great thinker shall reconcile these two statements. I mean, in the metaphor, it seems easy to reconcile the two statements. You need the soil and you need to grow up into a plant. Yeah. Is, could this be like a, a critique of how people view history? Like some may view it as the only important thing and that others just not caring about? Well, the soil kind of implies that, I guess. So I think, so as I said, you know, when we get to Nietzsche, the, the title of the essay is going to be Uses and Disadvantages of History for Life. So obviously we will be talking about history. Um, um, are we talking about history here? Well, I mean, we're talking about something that, um, I mean, so I fuller at like Lori and Aglaron are not thinking about historiography at this point, right? Or about, like, um, so if by history you meant kind of tales of great men or whatever that they're not really talking about that one way or the other um on the other hand they are definitely talking about history i mean the whole thing starts off with how at every moment of joy that all the pain and whatever of the past is annihilated so um if anna Glaron says oh yes but we need it so, um, so they're, they're, they're talking about history in some at least abstract sense of history, about like historicality. So maybe for the flower that never, or like the kind that never gets to flowers, they never gets to be annihilated. And then they are the depressed people. <laughs> well, but, but you know, so so remember, it was pain there, but uh, but we're I'm trying to follow the idea that just as we have, you know, men have to be saved from pain, the fiends have to be saved from sin, and just as men are saved from pain by pain, fiends are saved from sin by sin, right? So that, you know, and that's why this metaphor is coming up, not in the discussion of pain as the way to happiness, like no pain, no gain or something, right? But like in a discussion of evil as the way to good. Um, and it's, you know, I mean, it's evil in the moral sense, right? Because we're talking about Lucifer and the son of God, so I see, you know, this was my sin, and, you know. So, um, yeah, so these people who stay too near the ground are thinking that since everything, I guess you could put it this way, since everything grows out of this soil anyway, 
there is there can't be anything pure and innocent. It's all got to come out of the soil. Um, so why bother? Right? It's like so they they're not so much. I mean, I guess you could say they're depressed, but they're like more. Um, Oh. Well, they're despairing in the theological sense of despair. They like the it, is the way of life, but that's just how it is. Yeah, but like the despairing of salvation, right? Like thinking there is no innocence to be had. It's too late. We all came out of the soil. I think, yeah, it's something more like that. It's not just. Um, being in a bad mood. <laughs> so, like, being in a bad mood is unpleasant, but despair is like a sin against the Holy Ghost. So, right. So, um, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so I was starting to say, though, that I, so, I mean, how it's about, you know, how it isn't or isn't a, is or is not about history or Fuller is a good question. They keep talking about the soul's progress, right? And sometimes they, I think they say the only great theme is the soul's progress. So that there again, it's it's a kind of history, but it's um, it's more about knowing yourself as having a history. Than as like knowing well, okay, except that when you put back in the stuff I was talking about last week, that also means there's an issue like this for a nation as well. And that would be getting, I guess, more towards history as we usually think of it. The nation coming to terms with its history, understanding itself as having a history. How can it, yeah, I mean. You know, how can a nation like take pleasure in the unearned joy and happiness, knowing that it's come out of past evil? Should it deny the past evil, right? You know, and thereby annihilate it, ignore it? Um, um, you know, cover it over with mythology or something like that? Uh, or should it say, look, you know, like those people when the, when the Trump supporters had the Make America Great Again hat, there were people with hats that said America was never great, <laughs> right? That would be kind of like this, <laughs> right? Like saying, you know, everything has come out of this evil. It's just no, you know, it can't be anything good. Um, so, uh, yeah, so in, that, so in that way, it is about history, but I guess, it, like, you have to. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, in that way, it is about history, but I guess you kind of have to put pieces together to see that. Um, Okay, but I, what I was going to ask is, um, in a way, I know I was just talking, I, I partly answered this, but um, no, no, I think there's more to say about this. So if that's, what the, if that's what the flower stands for, what's at stake in pointing out that the flower specifically is what has its roots in um, something dark and subterranean. And I, actually, I don't know if you were in or not when I was talking about that. Well, I think you probably were. I wasted so much time. But <laughs> about, you know, about how the, the flowers stand for like innocent, unearned joy, the positive present that nature gives us. So, um, So what's this, what's at stake in showing that 
been recognizing, I mean, it's weird because it seems like forgetting is important. We want to forget the dark masters, but we don't want to deny them. I don't know how to understand that distinction. Maybe I'm misunderstanding part of it. Maybe we're not really supposed to forget them. It seems like they agree that, that forgetfulness is a good thing. And but that Glaron says, again, like, yes, it's great that we forget it, but that doesn't mean we didn't need it. <laughs> so, like, on some raise to a higher power, we don't forget it. <laughs> it's like something like that. Um, so, but anyway, um, um, so this is something that Aglaron writes to Emily. Now I haven't gotten into all the details of the, you know, this long story about Emily and L and V, and um, I think again all of these details are probably important. But um, um, well, I might say a little bit about it at the end. But so, but. For now, it's just, you know, Aglaron is writing this letter to Emily. Emily is like thinking of leaving her husband, L, and eloping with V. And uh, because she'll never be happy with L. And, and also, she says he will never be happy. So, um, so Aglaron says, I told her that my view must differ from hers in this, that I had from early impressions a feeling of the sanctity of the marriage vow. It was not to me a measure intended merely to ensure the happiness of two individuals, but a solemn obligation, which whether it led to happiness or not, was a means of bringing home to the mind the great idea of duty, the understanding of which and not happiness seem to be the end of life. So like on the surface, Aguaran is taking a kind of uh, Aguaran is, is portraying Emily's position as utilitarian, you might say, right? She, she assumes that marriage as an institution is intended to further the happiness of the people who are married. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, you could say, oh, it's not only about those two individuals. It has to do with the happiness of the community or something like that. But that's not the direction that Glaren goes in, right? So, so um, Glaren says, whether it leads to happiness or not, it's a means of bringing home to the mind the great idea of duty, the understanding of which, and not happiness, is the end of life. So, um, or seemed to be, seemed to be the end of life. Life looked not clear to me otherwise. I guess this is in the past tense because it's all indirect discourse. That is, it's all the letter that he wrote to Emily that he's now telling us about. So it doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't seem to him to be the end of life now. All right. So, um, so the surface, this is a kind of Kantian response to this utilitarian view of marriage, right? Saying, like, okay, your first mistake here is to think that the end of life is happiness. You know, that we were put here to be as happy as possible. No, we're put here to do our duty and, uh, and marriage. So, now, I mean, at this point, there's a kind of inflection to the explanation, which is not found in Kant's own discussion of marriage, right? Like, Kant famously says that marriage is a contract between two parties for the use of one another's genital organs. So, um, uh, Kant himself was not married, perhaps, fortunately. <laughs> but, uh, Although I know someone who claims to be dis a descendant of Kant. He says it's a tradition in his family 
and I said, well, you know, he was never married. And uh, he said, yeah, you know, but he had a, like, uh, servant. <laughs> We're descended from her. <laughs> well, uh, it's no surprise in that. He can't never portrayed himself as the standard of virtue. Right? I mean, the only person he ever portrayed as a standard of virtue is Jesus, I think. So, yeah, but anyway, um, right, sorry, you came in the middle of a digression about Kant's perhaps illegitimate descendants. But um, in any case, like uh, the, this explanation of marriage, I mean, it's more like what Coleridge says about marriage. It's not just that marriage is an example of a duty that you have to keep because you should keep your promises or something like that, which is basically what Kant says about it. It's that marriage is a symbol of the idea of duty. A means of bringing home to the mind the great idea of duty. So um, now it's not exactly explained here or really explained at all why marriage in particular is a symbol of the idea of duty as opposed to other duties. Um, but you can kind of, especially if you fill in stuff from Coleridge here, you can kind of imagine why marriage might look like a symbol of duty in general. Um, especially, like, also if you thought that, as she seems to, that, that the gender binary is somehow fundamental, as she seems to, and all the post Kantian idealists do, and so forth. Uh, but in any case, um, I, I don't really know how to explain that. It just, I feel like maybe it could be explained. Um, but what I want to ask you is, doesn't this point that Aguara makes here contradict the idea, Fuller's idea from the rich man, that for all men, not merely labor or luxury, but joy was intended? This is this unearned joy, as I was understanding it, that the flower symbolizes. So um, that is, uh, marriage is supposed to stand for the idea of duty, which tells you that what you're here for in this life is not to be happy, um, but to uh, understand your duty. I mean, to understand your duty it doesn't say to do your duty. It says to understand, to understand the idea of duty. But uh, still, whatever that means exactly, but by hypothesis, it's not the same as happiness and possibly inconsistent with it. Um, So um, you could resolve this contradiction by saying, and this is all getting back to the question of like, what does it mean to point to the flower in particular? I mean, this is all a little flimsy because Agarra doesn't actually mention a flower in the passage I'm basing this on, right? There's some kind of plant with its roots in the soil that's growing up to glory and beauty. I just assume based on what Fuller said everywhere else about the flower. You know, I think that's a pretty good assumption. But right. So anyway, the question is like, what's what's the point of what's the significance of pointing out a flower in particular is the thing whose roots we need to not deny, but on the other hand, not get kind of stuck with, not like identify it with its roots. And so, um, so this Aguara may think this that, um, 
Emily will actually need to violate her duty to get the joy that's intended for her. But she can't violate her duty unless she understands the idea of duty. <laughs> um, so then, I mean, the end of life in the sense of like um, the achievement of logic is that understanding of the sense of duty. Um, but then <laughs> you break it and you get this joy that was not, it's not end of life, it's extra. <laughs> I, so, I mean, I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure that's what Aguaron is thinking. Um, um, it depends, you know, you have to ask what he thinks the effect of that letter will be. Um, um, but, you know, if that's what she's thinking here, this really is a kind of antinomian. Like it's like, and it's it's not uh, it's not a utilitarian attack. I mean, that would be the reason for the contrast here, right? It's not a utilitarian attack on the institution of promises when you say um, this is what William Godwin says. Actually, I, think I mentioned him once before. Um, he was actually uh, Mary Wollstonecraft's husband. And the daughter was Mary uh, Wollstonecraft Shelley, the author of Frankenstein. But anyway, um, <laughs> um, William Godwin argues that promises considered absolutely are evil. The whole institution of promises is bad. Why is it bad? Because you say now you're going to do something in the future, but in the future you may have information, you may have new information that would lead you to realize that that's not the best thing to do. Something else is the best thing to do. So you should do that. <laughs> yeah, I said it's absolutely speaking as an evil. So he says, like, okay, sometimes we need, you know, uh, but it's like a necessary evil in that case. Right? So, I mean, that kind of. Util, you know, so I mean, other utilitarians uh, like turn all kinds of somersaults to try to explain how the institution of promising is backed up by utilitarianism and why it says that you should keep your promises, right? But Godwin actually says, no, you're right, promises don't make any sense. <laughs> so, I mean, that's basically Emily is basically taking that position about math. Well, I mean, maybe she's not taking it absolutely. Maybe only she got married when she was 15, and et cetera. But still, like, that's the type of argument she's making. She's saying, I shouldn't keep my marriage vow because, in this case, the disutility of keeping the vow is so great that it overrides whatever obligation I might have. And, but, but Aglaram is, is like acknowledging the full force of the, the, the duty to abide by the vow. And saying that like the achievement of happiness can't justify breaking it. Um, if it could justify breaking it, then you wouldn't really be breaking it. I mean, it would be gone, <laughs> right? You have to really break it. <laughs> that seems to be the thought. Um, so, uh, um, so. I mean, it remains the case that Fuller is not telling you to go around being evil, right? In other words, I don't think it's not like, as often does happen with Nietzsche, hopefully not in this class, <laughs> you know, like some student reads Nietzsche and gets really excited about it and goes out and starts killing people or something, <laughs> right? I mean, you, you wouldn't have that with Fuller. Right. I mean, you would go out and start being nice to the insane, or you know, like it's, you know. So I mean, that all of that is still true. And as I, I pointed out, the sin that the, that the Son of God commits 
in order to save the fiends of this really abstract sin, right? It's, you know, so, I mean, uh, uh, the truth is Nietzsche didn't go around killing people either. <laughs> You know, um, and uh, if he would give us any advice, which maybe he wouldn't, <laughs> he probably he wouldn't advise us to do that. Right? I mean, he said, Nietzsche, should I go out and kill people? And he'd be like, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, but so, right, so all this, <laughs> this is all a line aggression on the way to say that, you know, so it's not like it's not like Fuller is a teacher of evil in the sense that Machiavelli would be called a teacher of evil, right? You know, but it is. But when you get into the details of what she thinks good and evil are and how they're related to each other, it is actually this really extreme thought that seems to be present. Um, so that's kind of uh, the end of the answer to the question I started with. Like, is Fuller really a step between Emerson and Nietzsche? And I think the answer is yes, she could function as a step between Emerson and Nietzsche. Now, there's two minutes left. I had this other stuff I wanted to talk about, about friendship and whatever. I mean, there's obviously other themes. And the, as I said, the third dialogue seems to be about, especially about things related to friendship and loneliness and whatever. But given that there's only two minutes left, left I think I'll stop here. So, uh, and I'll see you. So, Thursday is a holiday. So, I'll see you next Tuesday. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Steve.